Hello, everybody. Live from LA, we are with Mark Varadian for a very special edition of um, our Duke in LA class, Studies in the US Culture sure. Industries, with um, the, the latest crop of Duke in LA students. Uh, back after a brief hiatus, we're very excited to have everyone here. We're very excited to have Mark Varadian here. So this is a co-production between Duke at LA and uh, Demon Live. And uh, so the rest of Duke will be able to watch you all um, learn and learn from the master Mark Varadian. We are very appreciative uh, to have you here once again. So I think we will let Mark uh, take it away. He has uh, your questions. And um, then after he talks, you all can um, follow up with questions you wanna ask him. Mark, is there anything else you wanna sort of? Go? No, I mean, it's, it's are you guys, everyone here is in LA. Are you guys in LA? I mean, that in and of itself is exciting. I wish we were in person. Uh, we often do this at Paramount, but they are not still not allowing uh, in-person gatherings, uh, you know, due to COVID. So we're still under that oppression, but um, I hope to and intend to meet you guys all in person sooner rather than later. Um, I think that's the best way to learn. And also for you guys, to see some of the magic of Hollywood, the places we actually use to shoot film and television. Um, that is what got me hooked originally. Just um, by way of background, my I went to Duke and uh, I was poli sci, uh, graduated in 89 and uh, thought I would go into a career in legislative work in Washington, DC. I spent two summers there during college and I was from not Los Angeles, but California, Southern California, Orange County. Uh, I, I intended to go here, come back here to UCLA for uh, law school, which was all part of my plan uh, to work in some sort of political endeavor, I guess. Um, but when I came out here, um, as I think a lot of people, uh, even now, um, I. I spent my first summer of law school back in DC working at a law firm and discovered the magic of billable hours, which, which it, it, for those who aren't well-versed in that, uh, when you're a lawyer at a law firm, you have to keep track of every five minutes of your day and you have to bill it to somebody. So being a great procrastinator myself, the idea of keeping track of every five minutes of my day was unappealing to say the least. And I quickly uh, put that behind me. In my second summer in law school, I decided to change course. And um, I, I still didn't think about film and television or media. Uh, I went to the undergraduate job center at UCLA, which at that time consisted of a bunch of cork boards with um, three by five cards that listed internships. And I went through that board and for the first time in my life now is at that point, probably a 23 year old. Uh, I really, for the first time considered what the career options were in the world at large. And those boards went from A to Z, uh, from archeology span and architecture to urban planning and zoology. <laughs> which wasn't in the cards for me. Zoology was definitely off the list. Um, but right in the middle of the A to Z was producing, which I did not really know anything about. And, you know, that was the first time, and I've heard this from a lot of people, which is why this business is so strange. It, it was the first time I realized you could make films for a living and work in um the creative industries uh it had literally never occurred to me that there are people making those things that i would go and see every week every weekend and so i pulled a few of those cards i called 
I was hired as an intern um, by a, a, a young lady who was an assistant to two producers who were brand new to producing. And I went and started interning for them at Universe at uh, Paramount, funny enough, where I am now in the dressing room building. And, you know, that was my first time literally setting foot on a sound stage, walking on a studio lot. Um, at that time, they were <clears throat> at that time they were producing um, a Star Trek series. So the lot was full of people in Klingon makeup um costumes literally walking around eating in the commissary and i walked through that giant gate at paramount i saw that and i never looked back um i just fell in love with it and so i stayed on there for um the rest of law school i, I worked i interned through my third year of law school and um having no idea of how to get a job, who to ask. Um, the person I had interned for, uh, her name was Ann, called me just out of the blue and said, uh, I got promoted. I'm going to be a film executive at Universal. I need an assistant, just as she was an assistant before that. Uh, we do that job. And I said, I will do it. But I have to take the bar first because I finished three years of law school and I have to take the bar. My parents are going to kill me. And she waited for me for three months while, until I took the bar, which I did pass, and I'm st still a member of the bar. Um, and uh, she got a temp. I mean, that was my break. My break was a young lady who was also new to the business, um, liked me as her intern and waited three months and hired a temp instead of a real assistant. And, and then, made me her assistant. And um, at that point, I probably knew four people in the film business. And I had no family background, nobody in my, my life had ever worked in film or television. And, you know, I just took the leap. And that was, um, I got out of law school in 92. So fall of 92, I started working for a living and got paid to actually do this. So 91, I was interning, 92, I was working. I was there for about a year and a half. And, um, and then she got me, my boss got me, uh, literally signed me up for an interview with Disney to be a creative executive without even asking me. And she said, you're ready to go time to get out, you know, and uh, see what you can do. And I got that job. I did my interviews and I was at Disney for 10 years um, as a film executive. And then after that, I decided to, I wanted to get closer to the filmmaking process. So I went to the producing side. I went to Warner Brothers. Um, I worked for a guy named Jerry Weintraub, who was a legend in the business, who had been a um, music manager for Elvis Presley, John, you guys may not even know some of these people, John Denver, Led Zeppelin, um, <clears throat> some of the biggest bands in the business. And then he went into film producing. I was there while we were making Oceans 11, 12, and 13, which at that time were sort of a throwback to the old Hollywood system of, you know, star system where we had four or five major movie stars hanging around all the time. Uh, that doesn't even happen now. I can't even imagine trying to put that movie together now, put them all in the same movie. Um, you basically shut down Hollywood for the period that we were making those because we had every major movie star in the world in those movies. And, um, and then I came to Paramount um, uh, with my current partner, uh, and I've been there for 15 years. And at, during that time, as most of you know, the biggest, most complicated things that I've done were the Transformers movies. We're now on our seventh, um, which is in post. And um, that's a short story of my life, which seems more and more irrelevant as the business changes. Um, but I still tell that story because 
a lot of people, including my own children who mentioned this the other day, I think uh, it's important for people to hear that you don't need to know exactly what you're going to do when you grow up. Um, you don't even need to know what you're going to do, you know, um, after you've grown up, because uh, certainly in this industry, um, it can be ever changing. So, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot of people, I think, I never set foot in the career center when I was at Duke. I didn't think about it. I was, um, I was a swimmer that took up a lot of my time. And I just, I, I guess I thought I was going to law school, so I didn't have to even explore what you know, possibilities that were out there in the world for me. And one of, one of the things we talk about a lot, I'm on the Duke alumni board is, is people like you um, choose careers or majors pretty early on. You know, some, a, a Duke student I met in London told me the internship you do between your freshman and sophomore year is basically the job you're gonna get and the <laughs> defines your future in the world, um, which I laugh at because I know that's just not true, um, you know, so, you know, you put a lot of pressure on all of these decisions as if it's going to, you know, force you onto a certain path that you can never leave. And that, you know, again, that's just not true. I think um, when you're choosing your careers, nobody really explains to you, um, like billable hours to me would have been a real, you know, would have been a nice thing to know before I went to law school. Um, you don't think about the lifestyle of the job you're choosing or the career you're choosing. You're saying, I want to be a, you know, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, you know, but nobody tells you, okay, what does that mean when you're done, when you're done with school and you have that job, do you have to you know, what time do you wake up in the morning? What time do you go to bed at night? Do you work on the weekends? Uh, are you on call? Is somebody going to call you at 3 a.m. and say, you know, come down to the hospital, somebody had an accident? Uh, you know, they don't tell you that, you know, any of the things that really define your life more than the actual job itself. And, and so when I see some of the questions you guys are asking, it's interesting, you know, somebody asked about um, production coordinators um, versus producing um, and going back and forth. I mean, the, these are very, very different jobs and I'll get to all those questions too eventually, but, you know, I, people think the, that the media business, you know, which, I have to say that because it's so different from when I started. When I started, it was film and television. Now it's film, television, gaming, uh, social media, um, digital media. You know, um, my kids probably spend more time on TikTok than they do on movies. Um, you know, there's a big, broad um, category now of creating things in Hollywood. And, you know, I would say, a lot of people say, well, I'm not really the Hollywood type or I, they have an image in their head of what it would mean to be out here. But I will say there is a job. Uh, there's a million jobs in, in Hollywood. Um, and there's probably a job for every type of person, even somebody who's very analytical or doesn't consider themselves to be adventurous or risk taking or anything else. There are very, very safe careers in Hollywood. You know, when I was an executive, they, I didn't really have to leave my office. Um, you know, I did a lot of the exact same things that I do as a producer. I read scripts, I analyzed them, I bought them, I worked with the writers to develop them. I packaged them with actors and directors and budgeted them and, and, and made them and marketed them and all of that stuff that I do as a producer. But as a producer, I go on the road and I'm on set and I'm gone. Like I, last year, uh, for those who got my Christmas card in 2021, I, I said um, something to the effect that I missed my, uh, for my family unit, which includes my kids, my wife and my parents, I missed everyone's birthday. 
I missed Father's Day. I missed Mother's Day. I missed um, Fourth of July. I, I missed every kid's major event. Um, one of my kids got COVID when I wasn't here. One broke his ankle. Um, that's the life of a producer, though. You know, you're gone. I was gone for six months. And in that case, because of COVID, I wasn't able to come back and my family wasn't able to come to me. So that's a very big difference between a producer and a, and a film executive. A film executive gets all the joy of creating, of being creative, of working with writers, of building stories. And they get none of the pain of being on the road. On the other hand, they're not there for the million and one decisions that we make as a filmmaking team um, that define a movie, you know? And, and for me, that used to drive me crazy because on any given day, you're sitting there on set and you're gonna make a choice. You're gonna change somebody's wardrobe. You're gonna, you know, paint a wall. You're gonna um, cut a scene because you're running out of time. Um, or a location, you know, gets pulled by whatever city you're working in and you've got to redefine the movie. You've got to shoot it somewhere else. You've got to, you know, so, so, you know, that's a big difference, but as an executive, you know, my studio gave me a car, they filled it up with gas. They gave me insurance. They gave me, you know, a 401k, um, you know, and all that. So at that time I was, a, you know, I wasn't really familiar with um, entrepreneurial, you know, um, instincts and all that stuff. So it was a good job for me. It was actually a good way to segue into this business. But then as I got more comfortable with that idea, I went into producing, which is much more entrepreneurial, but, you know, um, a production coordinator versus a a producer or a line producer versus a creative producer. I'm a creative producer. I'm not a line producer. A creative producer, you know, is making all of those decisions um, that define um, the storytelling. A line producer is not making any of those decisions. I mean, they might, there's always a little bleeding between the roles and there are line producers who are, you know, um, legendary and have been in the business for a long time who would consider themselves to be creative producers. And, uh, but for the most part, a line producer is really dealing with the nuts and bolts of the movie, like uh, hiring, you know, crew, hiring grips and electric, you know, ordering equipment, renting equipment. How many days do we need a crane? Uh, do we need an air conditioner sh when we're shooting on in a house in uh, Altadena in the middle of the summer where it's 120 degrees and the house is our location and, you know, they have their own air conditioning, but probably not enough to keep 25 people cool. You know, those are the decisions of a line producer. And there are, you know, line producers who are very proud that that's what they do. You know, they're, if you're, you know, I was trying to find the perfect analogy for these jobs and there isn't one really, but if you're building a house, which is a good analogy for making a movie, because it's also a very expensive enterprise that usually goes over budget and over schedule. If you consider it that way, it's a very apt um, metaphor for filmmaking. But um, in that scenario, I'm trying to decide if I'm the architect or if I'm the you know, the line producer is definitely the general contractor, you know, and I might either be the home builder or I guess the director is the architect. Um, it, it, it's, it's never quite perfect, but you get the idea. But there's a million jobs out here is my point. And some people, I had an intern who has had a great career as um, doing color on movies. And she came in here saying, I want to you know, work uh, in color and I love sitting in the dark and working late at night and essentially painting these frames and making them perfect. And, you know, at that time I said, that's crazy. You're, you know, 19 years old, like 
that's not the job you want. You want to, you want, you know, something glorious, something she said, no, this is what I love to do. And 10 years later, that's what she's doing. And she's a huge success and she loves it. And the person she married is also in you know, color timing and uh, they have a great life. So, you know, what do I know? But um, not everybody wants their name and lights. Not everybody, you know, thrives on, you know, the, the glamorous parts of this business. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of people take pride in, you know, um, the brute force, you know, that it takes to get something done. Um, and, uh, you know, setting up equipment, finding ways to mount uh, cameras, inventing new equipment. There's a million ways to be in this business and to be creative. So, um, you know, I always, I used to define it as you could be an agent, you could be a executive, you could be, um, you know, in film or television. Um, but there's a lot more than that, you know, and, and agency and representation is a whole other side of the business that, you know, or being a lawyer, by the way, I could have easily, as a, having finished law school, been an, an entertainment lawyer, which, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, that's great. You're in the movie business. You're an entertainment lawyer. From my side of the business, I would say that's not, you know, what I was looking for. Like, if you're a lawyer, you're not creating anything right you're doing contracts and you're but you are getting the satisfaction of you know making these movies happen you're finding ways to negotiate a deal and convince an you know actor or whoever director to do the the movie you know so lawyers in this business are creative in different ways and they're still going to movie premieres and they're still flying to Sundance to meet their clients and they get a lot of the glamorous part of the business. They work nine to five, they go home at five and they don't work on the weekends. And so that's a lifestyle, that's a choice, right? Um, so that might be perfect for some of you. Um, you know, so um, financing is a whole different side of the business. There are people I talk to all the time who are MBAs or whatever, and they but they want to be in this business. And I will say there's always a pull, no matter who you are, towards the creative. You'll see it if you watch executive shuffles and things like that. You know, somebody was talking to me about the um, um, the merger with Discovery Networks and Warner Brothers and David Zaslav runs Discovery and, you know, the stocks of AT&T and Discovery have gone down since they announced the merger and they're saying, is this guy going to walk away from the deal because his stock's gone down and somebody answered, not a chance. This is his whole life he's dreamed of being in charge of a movie studio, even though what he did was reality television. And so you see a lot of that too, you know, everybody is is pulled into the orbit of the creative process because that's in my opinion the most interesting part of the whole game but um you know so so it's a you know it's a incredibly satisfying thing to be a part of creating and that word is important to create because there's not a lot of jobs in the world that allow you to create something, right? And as I always say, in my business, we start with nothing and you just start building, you start figuring it out. You, you know, you're molding clay and by the end of it, you have, you know, in my case, a film, in other cases, uh, by the way, I'm getting like a, a email at, or a, a phone call, business phone call at 8 p.m. That's another part of the business. My job never stops. Um, just a funny aside, my kids at my kids' school for the first few months I was there, they thought I was a doctor because I was always taking phone calls and they thought it must be terribly important for me to take a phone call in the middle of a school event. And uh, in fact, it wasn't terribly important. It was just my job. So um, I, take, I have phone calls and emails coming in at all hours. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so, uh, what was I just saying? I can't remember one second ago. 
um, it, the creation process. A anyway, there, there, there's very few jobs like that. I don't, you know, I haven't been a banker. I haven't been even really a lawyer or um, a doctor. And there are a lot of important jobs in the world, um, but there is nothing more satisfying than creating something. Um, if you've ever built something at home, even the smallest thing, you know, uh, um, um, for your house, there is an incredible satisfaction in, in building. And um, that's the joy of this business if you go into it. And you won't get that in too many other places. The other thing I always say, and it's a corollary to that, is that um, I have now been doing this since 1990. So 31, 32 years, I guess. And I can say in that time, um, and, and the, the power of this, until I say it again, the power kind of goes away because, but I know people who've had regular jobs. I've never in 32 years uh, thought of this as a job. And um, I say that sincerely. I don't say that lightly. Like there has never been a moment or a day where I woke up and said, oh shit, I gotta go to work today. You know, um, this is gonna be a hard day or uh, I can't believe it. I wish I could get this week off. It's, um, it doesn't ever feel that way to me because it's not regular work. I've had jobs, a lot of jobs that were jobs and uh, where I looked in the mirror in the morning as I'm shaving and said, you know, talk to myself and say, I can't believe I'm going to do this again. My summer job at, at a law firm, I couldn't, every day was misery for me. Every day I counted the hours. Every afternoon I'd look at my watch and it would be like three o'clock and I'd say, oh my God, I have like three more hours to get through. And, um, a lot of jobs are like that, I hate to tell you, but um, that's, you know, for me, that would not have been something I could do. It just wasn't, it's not in me uh, to spend my time that way. And um, so it wasn't much of a choice for me. I'm not even sure now what else I would be capable of. I have a friend who's a uh, orthopedic surgeon and that sounds like a cool job but he, he refers to himself as a mechan mechanic. And uh, imagine in his words, every day I walk in, I have three operating rooms and I walk into the first one and somebody broke their wrist and I go and fix their wrist. And then I wash my hands and I go to the next one and somebody broke their ankle and I fix their ankle. And then I wash my hands, I go to the third one and somebody broke their elbow and I fix their elbow. And then I go back to the first one and it's another wrist and another elbow and they're built a certain way and the screws go in a certain place. And, you know, sometimes there's something catastrophic that requires some, you know, improvisation and all that. But imagine fixing three wrists a day, five days a week for 32 years after 600 broken wrists. Uh, you're probably not going to see anything new, you know? Uh, and so you have to really think about these things, you know, and some people, you know, do you want a career? There's, there's, I know a lot of people that graduated with me who just wanted to make a lot of money fast and stop working. And they did that. And be, why? Because they, they didn't like their jobs that much. And once they were done working, they could do the things they really cared about, you know, whatever, fly fishing or something. Um, but my philosophy was, was not that. It was, you know, most of your life is going to be spent on your job, in your career. And so if you can find something that you don't loathe and something you actually find challenging and, you know, that strikes your curiosity, then you don't you're not in a rush to get done with it, you know, and uh, move on to something else. Um, so I guess, you know, I never planned for these um, lectures, but I sort of roam around if you guys um, don't mind before I get to your questions. But, you know, the, the other important thing to note is, is how much change has come uh, to the business since I started. And, you know, 
when I started at Disney, um, we had three film divisions, which were Disney Touchstone and Hollywood Pictures. And they were combined making 35 to 40 movies a year. Um, and the first 10 years of my career was spent in a contraction basically where they had decided that we were making too many movies and every weekend was crowded with a film release and it's too hard to convince people to show up when there's 40 choices in every theater and so we started making less we went from three divisions to two to one and to making basically 10 movies a year and there was a period where you know, not much was getting made and there was still, everything was dominated by the, by major networks like NBC, ABC, CBS. And that was, I would say the lowest period in the business. And that was, um, you know, I, at that time it felt like that was permanent and yet everything completely changed again since then. I mean, um, the biggest change by far in my period in the business is, is an obvious one, which is, you know, the advent of streaming. And um, I think um, when we thought we were making a ton of movies, making 35 movies a year, now Netflix, I think they're making less now, but they announced a couple of years ago, they were making 80 at one studio and um, everybody else was making a lot more too. Um, the volume of what's getting made now is incredible, um, which is, I guess, good news in the sense that there's a lot more people working in these businesses now because of that. Um, but the good news in it, in it all, and I'll get into more detail on that, is that when I was at a film studio at Disney, we were very limited in terms of the kinds of stories that we were able to tell. And we and that and that studio made a lot of crazy, you know, kind of movies. Took a lot of risks, um, but you know, I would literally get lectured by my bosses. Like, if you made an action movie, you had to set it in the United States. Uh, you know, you'd say, "Hey, what if we did one in India?" You know, and they'd say, "Yeah, nobody wants to see a movie, action movie set in India." They would literally say things like that, and. Um, and so you'd make every movie would be set in New York City or maybe Chicago or maybe L.A. And now you can set a movie anywhere. You know, it's it's um, you know, you can I would say at this moment in time, you can tell any story in any place of any scale, you know, with or without movie stars. There's a way to get it made. And, you know, it's really only a, a question of how much money can you make it for because it might have a very small audience for that particular story, but between streaming, um, various streaming services and local language programming and all that stuff, I, I can't think of a movie or a story that, that I would say absolutely couldn't be told. And, and that's the good news. Um, it's um, the variety is, is pretty incredible. And, you know, that that's a world we live in now. So, you know, streaming, I say the, the verdict is still out on that because the downside of streaming is, you know, you don't have as many theatrical releases, movies that are released in movie theaters. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of the glamour of the movie business was based in that in, you know, a communal event where you have, you know, hundreds of people coming together, uh, physically together, laughing together, crying together, jumping, scared together. Um, and, you know, that has gone away, maybe not forever. I mean, people always want to know if we think that's that business is done. I think when COVID's over, we'll know for sure. But I don't think it's done. But you know, now, now mostly people are watching all of this stuff at home. So you don't have premieres, you don't have red carpets, you don't have, you're losing some of the allure of this, you know, that, that allowed us to be the major form of entertainment, you know, in the world. And the other, the other side of it, it's not all just about streaming. There are other things that are drawing your attention, right? TikTok or YouTube or, 
uh, gaming, video games, mobile games, console games, you know, all of these things didn't exist in, in, you know, this at the scale that they do now when I started in the business. So you really on a Friday night didn't have a lot of options. You could go to dinner, you could go to a movie. Um, you know, now you can do a lot of other things. So we have to compete and, you know, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, we were making a lot of bad movies for a long time. And, you know, we're asking you when you go to a movie theater to A, spend your money, which you don't, you know, really do when you're streaming, right? You pay the monthly subscription, but you don't, when you turn on a show, you don't think you're, you're not laying out cash every time. So, for to go to a movie, you really have to think about it. Do I want to get in my car? Do I want to park? Do I want to sit next to a live person who might be, you know, texting during the movie? Do I want to pay fifteen dollars for shitty popcorn? Um, you know that that's that's all a choice, you know. And and so we are now forced to really make that compelling for you, um, you know, as a choice to go to the theater. So my kids who are 12 and 14, the only movie they've asked me to see in the last, you know, couple of years was the last Spider-Man. And I still don't know why I ask them, but, you know, I don't know how it even got to them. I don't know what marketing mechanism got to them because they don't normally pay attention to that. But um, just to, you know, indicate that it is possible to beat all of those other forms of entertainment. It's possible to supersede streaming. Um, you know, once they went and saw that, they went back and watched every Spider-Man ever made. Um, they went back and watched every other um, Marvel movie because they're all interconnected. And they watched every Marvel show, um, including Hawkeye, which just came out or whatever. They now know all the connections between all those characters on all the shows. They can explain it to me um, in a second. They look at me like I'm an idiot. I'm like, who's that guy? And they're like, that's the guy, you know, from uh, Spider-Verse. And, uh, you know, like the, it's incredible um, so the power of that, and I know it's the biggest example of, of success is the Marvel universe, but it tells you what's possible. And, you know, so, so we're in a world where if it's streaming, it's streaming, it's fine. I think everybody's sort of given over to that. There was a period where, you know, nobody wanted to embrace that because there were purists, um, who thought you should only watch these things in movie theaters. Uh, but even Spielberg and these guys have given in to that. And so has Marty Scorsese. Somebody wrote about that. Um, they've all given into it. And I heard, I listened to a podcast um, this morning with Bradley Cooper and he made a very good point. And he said, you know, here's, how do you feel about theaters going away? And he said, here's the, the reality when he saw Raging Bull and, you know, uh, Taxi Driver and all these movies that were, you know, seminal in his life that that got him interested in being in this business. Uh, he said he didn't I didn't see him in movie theaters. Right. We didn't they weren't in movie theaters. I was too old or too young for that. I watched him on a 16 inch TV and and he said, I still have never seen them in a movie theater but I fell in love with those things and I fell in love with them on a 16 inch screen. And so it's hard to argue with that, you know, I mean, um, it is a visual medium, but it's a lot more than that. Um, it is an audio medium. I would say the sound work that goes into our movies, the scores, the music choices are as important and powerful as anything that's on the screen. Um, it's also a storytelling medium and the language and dialogue that's coming out of the mouths of these actors is as powerful as the imagery. Um, and that can make you cry, that can make you laugh, that can make you sing. Um, so, 
you know, some, I don't know what it was that Mar one of the questions was about Martin Scorsese um, and his view on the blockbusters and all that. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I presume he, he probably doesn't think that they're cinema or that they're worthy, but having watched my kids consume those and knowing how, you know, emotionally attached they are to those characters. My other, my younger son just watched the whole Harry Potter series again, third time. And, you know, by the end of that movie, I was emotional watching the end of that last movie where, you know, the teachers that had harassed these guys for however many movies, seven movies who seem mean and whatever are fighting side by side with their students to save um, each other and to save Hogwarts, that was emotional for me too. And it was certainly emotional for them. Um, and, you know, a lot of these movies, I grew up on Star Wars, um, a lot of these movies were the thing, even though they're pop culture, that, you know, introduced children to the idea of heroism and of sacrifice and of fighting for what's right and fighting against what's wrong. And you can, you know, in the, in the old days, the, the source, the, the, you know, wellspring of, of um, morality was religion. And I don't want to say that this is religion per se, but you need some shorthanded way in a in a civilized world of of indicating to especially people that are growing up like you know the themes of life itself and you know because not everybody gets out of their neighborhood not everyone even gets more than a few blocks from their house they're probably not going to see afghanistan they're not gonna you know they're not going to see a lot of things and and we can show that to them in our medium of storytelling and um that might be the thing that gets them, you know, on a plane, you know, uh, visiting somewhere else on earth and, and, you know, possibly doing good things. And so it's a very powerful, powerful medium. And that's the other thing. Uh, I don't know if satisfying is the right word, but if you want to work in a business that has influence, on people around the world. I mean, it might be as trivial as changing, you know, hairstyles or clothing styles or, you know, musical tastes, um, but it might be a lot more than that. And it's, it's um, there's very few things in any country, but particularly the US that travel around the world. This is one of our industries that is the most successful in the world and, and, and it's very influential. So it does, whether you're making, you know, Star Wars or um, Taxi Driver, it does have meaning and it does change people. And at the very least, the value of entertainment has been proven. Uh, the significance of that has been proven during COVID because a lot of people, um, you guys probably had people to talk to or hang out with or whatever, but a lot of people didn't. There were a lot of people who were alone uh, for the last two years and who had nothing um, to keep them, you know, from despair except this, you know, um, and that's important too. It's, it's um, one of my old bosses, Joe Roth, who was like, who is, I guess, still, uh, one of the titans of, of the modern business um, used to make us watch Sullivan's Travels, which, you know, is all about that. It's all about, um, you know, the depression and, 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 and making people laugh. And, and um, you know, he believed in this business and, and, and he believed in the power of this. And, you know, the one concern, I guess, with the state of affairs now is, you know, do we have people running these companies? These are all huge conglomerates now. These, there's been this consolidation. Do we still have people running these things who care deeply about, you know, storytelling? And if there's any concern, that, that would really be my only concern is do you have 
just business people running them? Or do you have people who grew up on this uh, for whom it was meaningful? Um, you know, a guy that everybody liked to make fun of when I was at Disney was Michael Eisner, who really reinvented Disney. Um, and he would call all the time and, and complain about what we were paying people to do this stuff, et cetera. But, you know, and, you know, the deals we were making and back end deals and all that. But at the end of the day, he would always say yes to our stories because he was a kid who grew up in New York City and his older sister would take him to the movies and take him to shows on Broadway. And so he was a true believer. And, you know, yes, he was a corporate guy. Yes, he was a CEO. Yes, he made a, a shit ton of money in the industry. But, you know, he would have died to protect storytelling. And I think you see that in the Netflix guys, um, Ted Sarandos and these guys. I think you see it in the story I told you earlier, you know, David Zaslav, I don't know him, but from what people tell me, like the idea of running the famed Warner Brothers Studios for him is a lifelong dream come true. So he's somebody who, you know, cares deeply about this. And I hope, I hope, that it's never taken over by people, you know, who will just try and churn out as much as they can, as fast as they can. And it's not about pop entertainment versus Academy Award worthy, you know, dramas. Um, but it's about, you know, the people who make these big poppy movies care about this and, and they work at it you know, at levels that you, you can't possibly imagine. I mean, these are people, you know, say what you will about Michael Bay. He's, he's up at 3 a.m. color timing, you know, the last ad that's going to go on the Super Bowl. And, you know, because he wants it to be perfect. And so there's not too many people that care about anything on that level. And, you know, that's the kind of people that are here. Um, and it's exciting to be surrounded by those people. And, you know, you see that hear this, heard the stories, like I always love these stories of internet startups. And that's kind of what we are. Like you, people are running around at 2 a.m. in their socks saying, I've got an idea. You know, that's us, you know. Uh, we are entrepreneurs just like they are. We take huge bets spend a lot of money, put it on the line on an idea on just, I think a giant robot movie is a great idea, you know, and people are saying, well, how do their mouths move if they're made of metal and do they have lips and, you know, <laughs> should they even talk? I, I mean, and, and, um, you know, that kind of thrill of invention that you find in you know startups is what we've been doing forever since the beginning for a hundred years. Um, so you know that's sort of a broad overview of everything, and you know um, hopefully that gives you some sense of it. I mean, there's a lot of specific uh, questions, and I'll go through some of these now. Um, but, um, I, and, and obviously any questions, maybe I should stop for a second and see if you guys have any questions about what we've talked about so far. And then I can go into some of your written questions because you have some good ones here. Should I go into these? I can't see if there's any hands up or not. I no, guess there's no, um, anyone raise your hand or um, there's nothing in the chat. Anyone have a question? Okay now or should we just go on all right let me let me go into to some of this um right, so the I first question, question oh yeah. jack has one i was wondering um just continuing on like the discussion of like cinema you touched upon it earlier i um i was listening to a discussion between it was this, i forget what magazines have the question between james cameron and danny villeneuve and they were discussing like the role of cinema today and james cameron had an interesting idea about um, is there a way where we can kind of make them work together? Um, is synergized the two experiences? I think he said he wanted to release like a 
one maybe a two hour cut of avatar two or three like in the cinema and then maybe a six hour cut on streaming is there something there that you see like in the future and how like the two streaming and the cinema can work together yeah i mean it's an interesting question i mean jim cameron is is a genius and again another person who you could say makes pop movies or you could say he's the most you know detailed devoted obsessive creator of all time you know um yes i mean you know what i love more than say you know the the reason that there's been this this sort of slow transition of things um in terms of streaming and theaters and whatever is that you know the battle that's held everything back that really we're still overcoming is that theater owners wanted um to control the theatrical release of these things right so every time a studio would say well what if we just put it in the theater for 30 days and then we put it on tv um and they would say no and they would they really had a stranglehold on the business for a very, very long time. And the problem with that was um, it didn't allow us to experiment ever, you know, and to say things like you're saying, well, what if we did a director's cut here? What if we did three versions of the movie? And, you know, one chain got one version, one, they would all, it was all, you know, the theater owner people, especially back then, uh, a lot of them were family owned businesses and before they were even like big conglomerates like AMC or whatever meme stocks now, um, you know, they wouldn't allow us to experiment. And, and I say this about every, every industry, we are the most antiquated, even now we are the most antiquated industry because everybody has data on what they sell in every other business. Um, and we don't when things are released theatrically, right? The theater owners collect the money. They, they sell the tickets. They, um, Fandango or what, I don't know where you guys buy your tickets online. You know, for the longest time, we had no information. So we didn't know if they bought it because they wanted to see, um, you know, Jennifer Aniston or if it was you know, because it was a Jim Cameron movie or did they see it twice or three times or, you know, all of that data that everybody uses for everything now to help you shape a successful um, enterprise. And and that was all really because of the theater owners and, and all of that. So now you have Netflix who has all the data it doesn't seem to be helping them, by the way, choose better movies for whatever reason, um, you know, they or television shows or whatever. Maybe it does. I don't I don't really know. You know how data driven it is, but they certainly have a lot of confidence in their data, and I'm sure Apple and um, Amazon and all of those organizations have similar things, but it is reassuring for them to know, you know why somebody clicked on something and why they watched it three minutes or why they watched the whole thing. Um, it just makes it an easier process. So in terms of, you know, can something be out in a theater and at the same time, you know, a different version online? I mean, I tend to think the end result will be yes and everything will be released everywhere at the same time and these businesses, if you're a theater, you're going to have to figure out how to make that experience worthwhile um, if you're going to compete with, you know, the streaming version, or maybe they'll pay more for the director's cut or a more premium version um, of that. Uh, you know, I mean, theaters never even did the work of put in better seats, put in, get better food. Um, you know, uh, how about just terminating the 30 minutes of previews you know um when we i went and saw spider-man with my kids i was literally my like i couldn't believe how many previews there were i'm like that's that ruins the experience so figure that out you know um 
but I do, I do like the idea that you can get different parts of the same story in different places, you know, and, and, you know, like, um, you know, you have to watch Hawkeye to know what happens to Kingpin, who was in Spider-Verse, who, you know, that's a cool idea. So I do think these things should live in different shapes and forms. And maybe the game version should also add something to that, um, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's about experimenting. These are different forms of storytelling. And um, you guys are probably more capable than I am of keeping track of all of those different threads. Is there anyone? Was that somebody else? No? Um, all right, so the first question, our readings for the class talked about three essential elements of, of producing talent, material, money. Uh, in your experience, which has been the easiest, easiest or the hardest elements? Um, I think they're all hard. I, I, none of that's easy. Talent, material, and money. Um, talent is, you know, extraordinarily hard on every level uh, to get somebody to be a, and by talent, I don't know, I, in my mind, talent is writers, directors, actors. Um, you're probably talking about actors. Every, you know, everything in my business flows a certain direction. You get a good writer to write a good story and that gets you a great director. The great director gets you the great actor and it never works, almost never works in any other direction because the only assurance that an actor has that they're going to not look like a fool in your movie is a good director. And so usually knowing that their careers can be ruined quickly, um, they will be very picky and they will not attach to something unless it has a great director. Um, so when I, when I, and then the second thing is material. So when I'm picking material, I'm really only thinking, I like this story. It's fine. Who cares what I like? Is it going to be an interesting story, interesting enough story that it will attract a good writer? And, and when it's well written, is it going to be challenging enough to attract a good director? And if we get that person, is the role going to be interesting to an actor? Um, that's the, those are the things I think about in material. I, I, you know, you can read it, you can like it, the writing's good. It's, you know, all of that stuff is great. Uh, it's a good story. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all irrelevant if it's not gonna attract those other elements. Um, money, maybe money's the easiest in a lot of ways. Uh, money is comes, if, you know, there's a lot of sources of money in Hollywood. There's independent money, there's studio money. Um, there's, um, I see your hand up. Um, is, is it Talia or is that right? Uh, one, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. So, so money is, is in some ways the easiest thing. If you haven't, if you have any of those elements, even if you just have an okay script or whatever, there's always somebody who wants to finance it. I try to stick to studios or streamers or whatever, because I like the support that that offers. It's a, it's a whole ecosystem. If I'm taking money from an independent source who doesn't, really understand how the business works it's always much harder and can fall apart and can be you know money can be tricky that way if you're getting it from a studio which is most of the movies i make money's pretty easy as long as you have the right material yeah go ahead talia yeah okay so this was kind of a pivot to a different uh topic but here's my question um, over the past few years, the Me Too movement has shown a light on rampant misogyny in Hollywood at all levels. And so yep. I'm wondering, as president of production for De Bonaventura Pictures, what measures you're taking to make your production a safer, more equal environment for women and what you think all Hollywood executives should be doing? Sure. So that's actually a question that's, oh, yeah, that was your question. There you go. Um, so, um, so, yeah, it's, it's. Um, it's a very complicated thing it, it, because there's so many contexts, right? Like one area we talk about a lot 
that has that people have tried to remedy, for instance, is crew crewing, right? So there's not a lot of women on film crews. There's more now than there used to be, but um, and I'm not, you know, a sociologist. I don't really, I've never studied the reasons why, but it's a particularly male environment in the sense that I can't, you know, you're you're moving heavy equipment, it's an industrial workplace. Um, you have giant cranes and lights and things like that that are, you know, um, uh, generally, you know, it takes a lot of, um, you know, horsepower to get that stuff in position. People get up at three in the morning, two in the morning. It's not a very appealing job. I'm not sure why those people, thank God they do it. I'm not sure why they choose to do that. But for, for traditionally, that was probably the purview of men because of you know, just the sheer brute force requirements of those jobs. Now, women want to do those jobs. It's, um, you know, and and because the appeal of them, I guess, is you're part of the filmmaking process. You're also in, in unions. You probably have good benefits. You don't have to work all the time. You can see the world. You can, I, I guess, as I talk it out, there's there's appeal to that. And, and you can work your way through production work into higher levels, maybe even to line producing and stuff. And, and if you, you know, if you're excluded from that, um, everything's harder. So, you know, but, but in, in our, you know, so in our world, there's still not a lot of, you know, a lot of those jobs are, you know, his, um, what's the word, you know, those people, their fathers did those jobs and their, their father's fathers did those jobs. So it's still a very, clubby thing like you know and especially in grips and electric and things like that so we um and i don't hire you know again going back to the separation that's a line producer's purview but we will make sure that you know uh if there are women who are interested in those jobs that we're hiring them but they might be the only woman you know in a grip crew or there's a lot more women in like camera departments and things like that um, but you can imagine like being one of, you know, percentage wise, I, I don't even know, like on a set in, in that in, in the particular below the line category. There's just not that many. So it's going to be difficult. You're going to have um, you're going to have um, issues coming up, you know, me too type issues all the time. And, you know, you're in the difficult position of especially now, which is an interesting moment because everything is getting made and there's very little crew and if you fire somebody are you going to even be able to replace them um it's it's always going to be a challenge so i don't think there's any easy answer to that stuff i just think you you know it's basically a zero tolerance um you know that's the only thing that works because you could always talk yourself out of it it's always going to make things incredibly difficult if you're you know, answering every complaint and you, and, and again, those don't come to me in, in particular, but, um, but if they did, I, I wouldn't really see any way around it other than to just say, you know, we can't have any tolerance. There can't be a middle ground in there. And if it means, you know, ultimately we have to shut down, we have to shut down. I, otherwise it's just impossible because there, there'd always be a good excuse to, you know, find a way, some middle ground to appease a situation um, where it comes up, you know, like in, in my world in, um, you know, by the way, there's, there's, there, it's, a, it's not just women. It's also, you know, plenty of men have run into those issues as well. Um, probably to a much smaller degree, but I know plenty of them um it's it's like in the world of uh corporate world you're not going to find a ton of it anymore you did when i started in the business you know it's it's a um um but now that all these companies are run by massive international conglomerates like they're not going to tolerate any complaints you know at universal pictures or whatever and there's also I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but there's a, a lot of um, close to, you know, equity in terms of female versus male senior executives and, and things like that at studios. Um, companies like Netflix are, 
are proud of their, you know, forward thinking and, you know, um, they are promoting um, to the best of, you know, anybody in the business, um, women in the workplace, et cetera. Um, what you have, you have a very awkward moment right now where I'd say the most challenging part of that conversation is um, like, for instance, female directors. There's still hardly any female directors in the business. And I have been telling, I could think of so many writers through the years that I always told, I said, you should just direct. Your writing is so vibrant. You obviously understand this. You should direct. And, and hardly any of them ever did. All, through 30 years, I can, I can point to almost nobody. And, um, and it's a strange phenomenon. And you're at a moment now where, and you have the same issue with people of color, um, you're trying to develop more opportunities. Um, and like, for instance, I'm making a Pet Cemetery uh, prequel. Um, we wanted a uh, female director. Um, we tried every one that we knew that had worked in horror. A lot of people start in horror, but then they move on and they don't want to stay in horror. We couldn't get anybody. So we hired our writer who, uh, is, who I'd worked with on Transformers and she is directing for the first time. And, um, you know, that was literally because there, you know, I, I don't know what the actual number is, but because there's almost no choices of female directors. And so you have situations like this where it's, it's uncomfortable because you have somebody who has never made a movie before. And her name is Lindsay Beer and she's extremely talented. The reason I was comfortable with her was because A, I had worked with her as a writer. B, she was so um, quick and definitive in her opinions of the project and the script. Uh, C, because she had been a showrunner in television and a showrunner in television is essentially the same. It's very producerial. It's my job. She has picked wardrobe. She has picked color palettes. She has picked lens packages. She has hired uh, directors. She has hired writers. She has hired actors. She's made a lot of the decisions that go into directing. And so, but it's a lot of work for everybody involved because she hasn't done all of it. And, you know, you need a little more time um, to learn the process. You need a little more time to cut a movie if you've never cut a movie before. And so people have to be willing to um, accept that and, you know, what, what ends up happening a lot is you hire somebody, you want to give them a chance, you're trying to foster, you know, a category of people um, in these jobs that they don't, they haven't traditionally had. Um, but the studio won't give you extra time on post. They won't give you, and, you know, so you end up having these battles with the studio and you say, well, she's never cut a movie before. So it's not 10 weeks for a director's cut, you know, which is what the Directors Guild says. Um, it's going to take more time than that. Like she's finding her way. This is almost like a training program. You have to put a different mindset into it. And so everything has taken slightly more time. Um, and we've had these battles, but the results will be great. And for me personally, and I always think selfishly, I don't just, you know, I'm not here to just do benevolence for people although I enjoy that and I like teaching, which is another thing that makes this easy for me because my parents are both school teachers. Um, it, but it's not just benevolence because she'll come out of this with a great movie and she'll be now one of 40 female directors and people will always want a female director, but she's gonna be my friend. She's gonna re respect having worked with me. She's going to uh, want me to produce some of her stuff. So down the road, you know, it will only pay benefits for me. And I think people need to understand that this isn't just, you know, um, uh, you know, I, this is going to sound harsh, but charity, you know, it's not just charity. Oh, let's help women get these jobs because it's the right thing to do. Um, it's going to help the business as a whole and, you know, one of those things when I said they would not let me make an action movie outside of America, now that we can tell all these stories, 
one of the, you know one of the things the audience is clearly demanding is original originality and original points of view and you're not going to get that uh from the same you know category of directors there's nothing against male directors or white directors or anything else but <clears throat> that's one corner of the world of experience like you know you're going to get a completely different point of view which we have on this movie from a female director or if you had you know some other a uh, person with a whole other set of experiences you're gonna get something original and 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 you know you guys know because you watch these things but i know the one truth like the greatest sin is for an audience and the reason things fail is because it looks like something else especially now you know when it's all on streaming right there's infinite shelf space you can find anything you want to watch but if it looks like something else, they're certainly not going to pay for it, right? When they can get it for free somewhere else. So we we are in a desperate struggle to give an audience something they haven't seen before. And the solution to that is not always, you know, let's put hamsters in space. You know, it's let's bring a completely different voice or point of view or set of experiences that we could never possibly imagine to bear on this story and it might be the same story that was told by somebody with a different set of experiences but it's going to look and feel and smell and taste different because of who made it um so i, I guess my answer is you got to look at this selfishly um if you can't look at it as benevolence, look at it selfishly. It will serve your purposes ultimately to um, to foster the the careers of uh, people who have not, you know, traditionally dominated these, you know, careers. Does that answer your question, Talia? Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so let's see, anyone else right now? Um, do you feel like you're able to express yourself creatively as a producer, even though the job is different than that of a screenwriter? Yes. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of crossover in the jobs, right? Directors often do some of the writing, actors rewrite their lines, um, writers sometimes um to the chagrin of the director will will write scene descriptions that are directorial in their scripts and the director will say who's directing this i don't need that in your script but there will be good ideas in there and the producer is wrangling all of that we oftentimes write you know half of the ideas that we generate for movies come from us not from the writer um there's a lot of writers who are good writers, but not good idea people. They don't have a lot of their own ideas. Um, um, and, you know, every writer is different. So I'm sure I'll hear from a million writers saying you're an idiot, but, and I am, but, but it's true. And um, it's interesting because a lot of writers and direct and actors and directors ask for producer credits. Producers never ask for writing credit. Uh, you'll notice. Um, but so but there's been many times where you know things that i've done would fall into the category of writing and creating and at the very least where <clears throat> we're reading their drafts we're making um corrections changes things that would fall into the category of like a a novelist's editor you know things like that you're like you don't need that cut that out or writers oftentimes don't understand production issues the best writers do and that takes time and experience but um so there's a lot of crossover i never feel like um like i'm shortchanged on being able to create or or uh define the direction of a story um i'm very interested in pursuing line producing we talked about this um they, there's not a lot of crossover between, you know, like a lot, like I've known people who've gone up the ladder of physical production, meaning um, they're a PA on a set, then they want to work their way into um, 
the AD ranks and assistant directing, you know, and then they, they hope to work their way up to um, line producer. Um, and in their heads, they're thinking, and someday I'll be the producer. Um, that doesn't usually happen. It's very unusual if that happens. It's, it's a very different skill set. Like if you work your way all the way up to line producer, you probably wouldn't know any of the writers that people want to work with. You wouldn't know, you know, the hot new directors. You wouldn't know the studio heads. You wouldn't know the buyers. You wouldn't know the agents. You wouldn't know any of the people that you'd have to know to be a creative producer. So if you want to be a creative producer, I would say it's great to be a PA on a set um, and to see how movies are made. Um, but after that, you're wasting your time. Like there's no point in working your way up the ranks to being, you know, an AD or whatever. Those are career paths unto themselves. They're very challenging career paths. And, um, you know, as somebody, my first boss, when I was an intern said, if you want to be a producer, produce, if you want to be a writer, write, if you want to be a director, direct, you know, um, he didn't believe in these roundabout ways of getting into, the one place you want to be at the end of the day. So, um, you know, I think there's truth in that. Um, um, uh, what initially drove you to the Transformers franchise? Um, so, you know, that was the beginning of the visual effects revolution, really. I mean, there were movies that had it before that, but what I'm talking about is I'm not talking about like cars flying off of bridges. I'm talking about character, CG character animation is what I'm really talking about. Uh, computer generated characters. And that was a revolution and nobody had done it before. And nobody knew at that moment that we could do it. So when we decided, you know, it was we can't take credit for that. Steven Spielberg was the one who um, bought the property from us and said this would make a great movie and um you know none of us it's hard to describe but you know even reporters who were writing about it you know a couple months before we we're going to release a movie thought it was an animated movie not a photo real live action movie uh, because i think nobody could conceive of a photo real character in a live action movie that was, you know, um, for an audience, something that you could accept. And so, you know, the idea of cars or vehicles that turn into creatures, robots, like you could imagine why that would be visually interesting, but would those be characters anybody would be interested to follow? Uh, I, I, I wasn't kidding when I said we had battles with the studio who said, the, the robots shouldn't talk. Um, why shouldn't they talk? They thought it might be goofy. Like you have giant metal mouths moving. You know, we spent a lot of time literally trying to figure out the lips. Like how would a, a hard steel thing have the flexibility to move, to open? We built these plates that shifted and all of this stuff. Um, but, um, you know, it was really Steven Spielberg who saw the possibility of it. It was Michael Bay who uh, had the, you know, um, courage to try and do it. And, uh, you know, because he was coming off of a failed movie in the island, a good movie in my opinion, but it didn't work in the box office. And so this was, he was taking a risk on top of a risk. And, um, and we all sat there and looked at each other every day we were making that movie and said, this is, is this the dumbest idea ever? Or is this the greatest idea ever? And, you know, as it turned out, it was the greatest idea. But when we walked into the first preview and a preview is when you test a movie with an audience, uh, we all thought we were going to fall flat on our faces. So, um, they, it turns out they loved it, but, um, but it was scary. Uh, it was a lot of money. Um, uh, Deepwater Horizon, somebody asked about, um, Brooks asked about um, the challenges of that movie um, and fires on set. Uh, we made that movie in New Orleans uh, because that sort of was um, the community that was affected by that disaster. It was a bold 
uh, thing for Lionsgate to choose to make that movie. Pete Berg was our director who was, um, who was an animal uh, in the best sense of the word. Like he had the, um, he had no fear, you know, and we built an oil rig, a, a you know, I think it was 80% scale in a parking lot, surrounded it with um, things called, we, there's a thing called a porta dam, port, like a dam, you know, porta dam. We surrounded the oil rig with it. We filled it up with water 20 feet high. We put boats in it. Uh, we built an oil rig uh, on land in the Six Flags parking lot in New Orleans. And, um, you know, it was to sell that as real um, was incredibly challenging. The, um, the fire elements, that was one of the first times that we used these LED walls. I don't know if you guys have seen those. A lot of filmmaking going forward is going to be done this way. It's how they make Mandalorian and all these things where you basically put a huge LED wall up, you shoot elements somewhere else and you project them on the wall so you don't have to go to a location. Um, and we put fire on those, but we had a lot of real fire and the rig was, you know, 60 feet up in the air. So it was very dangerous. A lot of code issues. We had to build with um, construction grade steel because we had hundreds of crew members up there. Um, and it was a probably one of the most physically challenging movies of all time. Uh, not for me, but in that case, for the line producer, we had to figure out how to put that all together and make sure that it was safe and that nobody got hurt um, in the making of that movie. So um, it was uh, it was it was it was an interesting that was an interesting ride. We had a good time, though, in New Orleans um, in movies with big budgets. Is there something that you pitch to the studios which makes them feel comfortable about the investment? Um, I mean, this is, again, like most of the movies I make are at studios. If you're, in some ways, it might be easier to, you know, put money together independently because people are less savvy <laughs> when they're outside of the studio system. Inside the studio system, they're pretty savvy. And... Um, you know, when you get a movie that's 100, 200, 300 million dollars, um, they're running the numbers pretty carefully. And, um, you know, the only thing that makes them comfortable is the filmmaking team, the director. Is it somebody who's had a consistent, uh, you know, record of success? Is there a movie star? Because they know either the movie star has to be the marketing campaign or um, is it such a big idea or such a visual um, medium that it sort of sells itself? Is it based on intellectual property? I mean, I could do a whole lecture on this, on what are the things that make a, a um, financier comfortable um, or attracts them to a project. Um, you know, so you know, if it's famous IP, if it's Harry Potter, that's going to make them comfortable. If it's not famous IP, um, you know, everything about film and television at the end of the day, and, and the artists in this group will not want to hear this, but everything is about um, selling. It's marketing. And all, all of the biggest challenges of the business are marketing challenges. And and the re one of the reasons that um, streaming is has become so popular is um, is that you don't have to sell those movies. I'll say movies, but I mean TV too. You don't have to sell those movies in the same way that you sell a movie that's coming out in movie theaters, right? If a movie is in the theater for thirty or forty or fifty days, you have a very limited amount of time to get your money back. You know. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the example I give is imagine if you built a factory before there was ever a, an automobile invented, you said, I have a great idea. I'm going to build this machine that has four wheels. It rolls on the ground and it has a, a combustion engine and it pushes you down the road. And nobody's ever seen that before. But, but they're only going to give you Friday night to sell it, one Friday night 
to sell it. And if it doesn't work on Friday night, you're done. Your business is closed. So you say, okay, I'm going to build a $100 million factory to build these machines with a combustion engine and four wheels. And, and you know, you, you build the factory. And on Friday night, you, you run out on the street and you say, look at this thing. It rolls and whatever. And the first person says, yeah, but my horse and my carriage does the same thing. It rolls. It moves. It carries me. What's the difference? You know, that looks like it could break. And uh, and then Saturday morning, it turns out nobody you talked to really liked it. And it's over. Shut the factory. Go home. Um, that's the life of a movie. You say this movie is about giant robots who talk and have relationships with people. And it looks totally real. You're going to believe it. You know, and if our movie doesn't catch on on Friday night, word of mouth is bad, whatever. Saturday numbers go down, Sunday numbers go down, they pull it from theaters on Monday. You know, that's the challenge. Um, you know, and uh, it's scary, you know, and when you stream a movie, they don't sell it like that, right? It sits on the shelf forever. They can, you know, they can get people to watch it Saturday night or next Saturday night or the Saturday after that, um, you know, or two years from now or whatever. They don't launch those marketing campaigns. So to get you to see a movie, we spend might spend $100, $150 million to get you to see the movie, to get you to go out and spend your money because it takes a harder effort to do that. It doesn't take a hard effort to get you to turn on your TV, grab a beer and watch, you know, whatever is in your queue. Um, so there's a night and day difference between selling a movie uh, for theatrical and selling a movie for uh, streaming. And that, that is the major difference. And the thing that gives Netflix comfort to make their things, you know, they can go and make a $150 million movie. That's a lot of money, but they don't have to spend another 150 behind that to sell it. So it's not a $300 million movie for them. It's 150 for us. That's a $350 million movie. And, um, so you can see that there's a much different level of stress, um, for those two categories. Um, um, how do you approach producing versus, ex does somebody have a question? No, Harry, you've got a question. I know you got a question. Um, how do you approach producing versus executive producing? Um, I always get that question. There's not a lot of difference. It, you know, in film, it's different in film and television An executive producer in television is the boss. That's the, um, you know, um, showrunner is the executive producer for whatever reason historically that's the top job a producer is a lesser job in television in film the producer is the top job and executive producers next down then co-producer and associate producer um i've been an executive producer i've been a producer a lot of it depends on you know like steven spielberg is an executive producer on transformers does that mean he's the number two guy in Transformers? No, he's the number one guy in Transformers. Um, but he wasn't the day in day out producer and he was gracious. And he's like, I'm not taking the producer credit because I'm not producing this. I'll take an executive producer credit. So sometimes financiers are given executive producer credits. Um, you know, line producers can sometimes be an executive producer if they're a very a uh, formidable line producer. They could be a producer producer, which is a big deal to give them that credit. Um, the Producers Guild, you know, gives a PGA, Producers Guild of America tag to the one person on a movie or a couple people who actually produce the movie. And by actually produce, they mean, were you involved in buying the property? Were you involved in developing the property? Were you on set for the production of the thing? Were you in post in the editing room, were you part of the marketing campaign? Then they decide who gets the PGA badge. So if you see movies now, you usually see PGA after the producer, you'll see five producers and two of them will say PGA. Those are the two that were actually there. Um, at what point do you think writers should try to get their work out there? And what might be the best way for writers to get their work on the radar of agents or producers? Um, you know, that's the million dollar question. That's what a lot of uh, people, you know, come out here. They're, they're, the problem with this business is there's no like human resources department for the movie business. You know, it's hard to get started. The first job is the hardest job always. 
and after that, it should be a lot easier um, for the most part. So a lot of my interaction with Duke people out here is, is to figure out how to get them the first job. And after that, I don't usually hear from people other than just, you know, I'll see them at a party or something, or we'll just catch up over, over lunch. But, but the part where they're nervous and, and how do I do this and who do I talk to is always at the beginning for writers. Um, it's probably hardest for actors, but for writers, it's very hard. Um, you know, usually writers, the pathway to recognition here, like I'm not allowed to read scripts unless they come from agents. Um, most executives are the same way and producers. And the reason for that is because um, a lot of people historically have been sued. Like somebody sends me a script about giant robots and then 15 years later, I make Transformers and they say, you made it because I sent you that script about giant robots in 1996. And I say, no, there's actually a property called Transformers. It was writ it was created as a toy in 1984, long before you wrote your treatment, you know, and then, but they're going to sue you anyway. So nobody accepts scripts unless they come from agents. So the question is, how do you get an agent? And the answer is, um, Agents are pretty busy. So usually you get an agent by starting with a, a manager and um, managers are in the business of discovering new talent and they have more time to read uh, unsolicited things and, and, and scripts, et cetera. And, um, and they discover people. And if they like you and they see that you have a body of work, which is important because it's hard to get an agent if you've written one script, Usually you'll need two, three, four things because they want to have more to sell. Um, but if you have a body of work, the manager will, will be able to get you an agent. The agent will send me the script and then you'll be in business. Um, you can also obviously use people like me who are here, who are trying to help communities like Duke um, and get people on, you know, um, get people started um so that again that could be a whole lecture unto itself um uh, recent blockbusters have brought directors from indie backgrounds to provide unique and fresh storytelling what are your opinions about such creative decisions uh will we work with those people so yes um this goes to what i was saying before like if you hire a female director to tell the exact same story you know, the female version of Transformers. I mean, um, we had two female writers on that project, um, where, whereas we had had only male, male people before. Um, I think that's a different version of a Transformers movie and people really loved it and uh, felt it was different. And, um, you know, um, that's why we hired the writers that we did and it's why we got Haley who's a great actor um and you know it's why that movie stood out it was meant to reboot the franchise because people had gotten tired we had had five movies that were we'll say four of them were very similar and um had a lot of the same action etc and we needed to show a you know a new point of view to get people re-engaged and uh, hopefully expand the audience. Um, you know, it had never been that interesting for women uh, Transformers. Um, and, you know, the idea was to broaden the audience too. And, and we did all that. Um, so, you know, the current uh, Transformers is being directed by Stephen Cable, who is, you know, started as an indie, um, a uh, filmmaker, and he um, most recently made uh, Creed Two, and um, so you know it's um, it's 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 great for us. I mean, it's you know, and the same thing with um, with Pet Cemetery. We're hiring uh, somebody who is is new to directing. Like, it's great for us to find new voices, and you know, it's also challenging because you have to uh, train people quickly under pressure while you're spending tons and tons and tons of money every day. So the pressure, you know, of, of putting somebody 
into a bigger movie who hasn't done it before, who doesn't know how, um, you know, to animate characters or to, um, you know, shoot, you know, massive action sequences with seven cameras. And, um, you know, that's a lot of stress um, for everybody, including the filmmaker. And, you know, you all just have to hold hands and, and say, we're not going to get mad at each other. We're going to tell you, you know, my pact with these people is I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. And if I think what you're doing sucks, I'm going to tell you that. And if you think what I'm doing sucks, you're going to tell me that because I've been doing this a long time. I don't have a fresh perspective. I've made five of these or six of these already. And I'm looking to you to bring fresh perspectives. So for me, the challenge is sort of hovering on the outside of the process and letting a new voice sort of dictate, but at the same time, if they're heading for the third rail, I have to jump in quickly and say, no, 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 you're going to get electrocuted, you know? Um, and so it's a challenge. I'm, I'm usually pretty good at sort of standing back and letting people do their thing. It, my best case scenario is I never have to do anything on a set. And sometimes that's the case. Not usually, but that's my dream. But, um, you know, Transformers, this one was a big step for our director, Stephen Capel. And he, you know, had the work ethic and he was such a fan of the franchise and he was so, you know, well versed in all of it. Um, it was very hard, but um you know i'm not sure that too many people could have pulled it off as he has pulled it off but um you know but it but it takes a village i mean it really took a lot of us working night and day and some new people we brought in who we tr trusted and and um you know like i said we held hands and and we figured it out but um that's not without a lot of conflict and tension and you know um but it was, uh, but that's, that's the fun of it. You know, it's a, it's a, I like the collaboration. You know, if you don't like collaboration, this is definitely not the business for you. Um, let's see. What genres do you see becoming successful in 2022? Um, that's a hard question. Um, you know, you know, if you believe the traditionalists, there aren't too many genres, you know, and there never will be, um, you know, it depends on what medium, you, you know, in the, in the theaters, which again, have not recovered, they probably won't recover for a year, a year and a half because of COVID. Um, truly, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, you, you have a country full of multiplexes with 14 theaters that are not going to have enough movies to fill 14 screens that's gonna be a real challenge. You're gonna have a revision, revision in the theatrical industry, you know, because uh, the only movies the studios feel comfortable spending marketing money on uh, for theatrical release are giant tentpole movies. Um, and will they ever release a smaller movie, um, you know, in a big way around North America? you know, I don't know. I don't know. Horror movies, I would have said were, um, were bulletproof for theatrical release, but you see Netflix has like 10 of them a month now. I don't know if that means people will say, I'm not paying for a horror movie. I'll just watch something on Netflix. Uh, they've kind of blown that business out. Um, you know, so in theatrical, what genres, I don't know. You know, um, it might just be blockbusters for a while. Um, in the streaming business, you know, it's endless. Um, what they're asking us for at the moment, you'll see, you'll notice if you're paying attention that Netflix opened a, um, a medium budget division. Um, they took an executive from Warner Brothers. Her name is Nyjah. She, um, she's a great executive. Her job, uh, it seems, will be to figure out like 40 to 
70 million dollar action movies you know which is my favorite kind of movie uh, that's could be john wick it could be um um extraction it could be you know a lot of the practical not visual effects driven uh hard action movies uh there's an audience for those especially in streaming um that spans far and wide you know the most devoted film watchers are still people who grew up watching films so call it 40 to 80 year olds uh they love those movies so you know netflix started out pushing elevated fancy fancy directors fancy actors awards worthy and i think they've quickly realized that the things that are killing for them are more meat and potatoes you know um if you look at yellowstone the biggest entertainment uh, sensation of 2021 was Yellowstone and maybe 2020 and probably 2022. If you, I don't know if any of you have seen it, it's very basic. It's, um, you know, it is meat and potatoes and it's by far the biggest show in the world, uh, far exceeding anything that, you know, fancy Hollywood people revere, like, um, you know, um, what's the one, uh, Doherty, the, uh, uh, fuck, I can't think of the name of it. Um, the one about the uh, Murdoch family that was originally about the Murdoch family. Um, anyway, uh, Yellowstone is the biggest. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so that is a, so meat and potatoes is basically what that division is going to be at Netflix and it'll probably be the most successful stuff. Um, so, you know, what genres, I think you can make anything, you can make local. Um, what I love is you can make something, in, you know, we could make a version of any of our movies in, you know, Russia or um, India or, you know, anywhere um, and do a local language version and, and it, it would be successful, you know? So uh, local language is one of the biggest pushes for Netflix because they don't, um, they're not growing subscribers in the US and North America. And that's another division that we haven't really touched on, which it could be another lecture unto itself, but the international market is very different from North America. So when you ask about genres or whatever, it's different country by country. And, you know, theatrical is different country by country. China built a bunch of um, new theaters in the last, you know, 10 years uh, with, you know, that are, that are nice, air conditioned, beautiful facilities. Um, and, uh, you know, COVID has sort of stalled all that. So take COVID out of the equation, who knows? Uh, they did the same thing in Eastern Europe. A lot of, a lot of countries that are, are or were third world countries have built theater chains and people who used to watch movies on, you know, um, pirated DVDs um if these economies have grown and again COVID has messed up everything but if a lot of them were growing for a long time so people who would have watched a pirated version might now have enough money to go to a movie theater and bring their family and sit in, in an air-conditioned beautiful seat and you know so um those those countries were in a place that we were at we were where we were 30 years ago so movies in theaters are still big or will be still big um in other countries bigger than they will ever be here ever again so um so it's hard to paint uh with one brush you know for the entire globe um so that's all you guys, all your questions. Um, what else can I uh, tell you? Anyone else? Anyone have, um, I want to honor your time, Mark. I know it's getting uh, later, but um, yeah. is any, any other questions people had that uh, you got specifically called out, Harry? So I don't know if you have. Uh, no, I read you. Harry's question. I got it. It's good oh, okay, to see you. you got that one in. All right. Yeah, it's good to see you, Harry. Um, well, listen, you guys can always reach out. Um, I will be here. I should be here for the term of your uh, time here. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to to answer your questions. Like I said, I'm the son of school teachers, so 
I like to share my knowledge um, and uh, help people as I can. And if I can't, you know, I usually know somebody who can. Um, but enjoy your time here. Hopefully, um, COVID is uh, in decline permanently. We'll see. Um, but it is a good, interesting city, more interesting than when I started. There's a lot, um, a lot to enjoy here uh, and a lot that is unique. Um, and I uh, hope you soak it all up and, uh, you know, hope you somehow get a real sense of what this business is, uh, despite the fact that things are a little bit off right now. Um, you know, but um, I will see you at the very least at the, I think you're having the a ninth, yeah. introductory thing. And then we will definitely throw our usual end of your term event. And, uh, and otherwise, uh, you know, let me know how, how I can help. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. Um, the, the consolation for this being Zoom was that we would be able to meet you in person um, on um, February 9th at, at our welcome party, which is not very far away. And of course, even on Zoom, you're incredibly, <laughs> uh, incredibly, um, it just, we, everyone learned so much. So um, we appreciate it as always, and I'm sure there will be follow-up questions and a lot of digesting of all of that information and um, just thank you yeah. so much. All right, my pleasure. All right, well, enjoy your time and uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Awesome, Bye. thank you. Thanks. Bye.